and here we move on to the next section here we move on to the next technical session headed by dr jasbinder kaur alwash academic her, his her academic qualifications or yame yamful and phd she is working as an assistant professor of english in kailas college admissure punjab she has about 10 years of teaching experience in various college she has got more than 15 papers in different journals six books chapters six books chapters and two edited books entitled contemporary literature in language and reason perspectives and psycho psychoanalysis of literature published she actively she actively participate in conference workshops and seminars she is in charge of english literary Associ society member of naac committee and member of board studies kailash amisha her area of lang interest in language is language and literature she has contributed recently in a revised edition of historic books of a historic college entitled a history of the kaila college amisha which was early published in 1949 by dr gan singh a well known historian welcome you ma'am thank you so much ma'am thank you so much and let me correct you this is not kaila this is khalsa college amritsar thank you khalsa sorry khalsa college is very it's a known college no it's very much okay as matlab there are problems we can't pronounce the other state's name even it can happen with me thank you so much for inviting thank you shall we move on to the session hello yes ma'am ma'am shall we start with the session yes ma'am you can carry on okay ji may i invite i think uh, kulvinder kaur is our first yes ma'am speaker kulvinder kaur sat scholar city university punjab yes ma'am uh ma'am please continue uh, yes ma'am uh good afternoon to all of you my topic is uh, globalization in baldev singh uh, uh, sadkanama's novel baldev singh was a monk the writer who returned his uh, 2011 satya academy award in october 2000 uh, uh, along with uh, several other winner of the award from uh, across of the country suraj the akhi's work of historical fiction exploring uh, the untold saga of the famous hero of punjab maharaja ranjit singh a historical novel says sadkanama is different from a history of the reader come closer to how a character feels things and responds unlike a history which is based on facts and figures released last year the novel was the fruit of a four year of extensive research by sadkanama he studies document and many books on maharaja ranjit singh no as the line of punjab the book agrees the author also evoked some countries as he has not shared away from writing about the human limitations and weakness of the leader of the sikh empire this he said was no pigment of his immigration but based on facts and study the novel is the history of punjab and india and also document the many important world event of the time and also the many dimension of the great rules ruler added the author the the re the representation of partigas satyam academy award the best book in punjab in 2011 from his novel dilli diya tama dilli de kingre on the punjabi rebel dulla patti baldev has also been honored with uh, several award including the uh, shiromani साहित साहित कार अवार्ड फ्रॉम द पंजाब गवर्नमेंट नॉवेल्स शॉर्ट स्टोरीज बायोग्राफी एसेज प्लेज चिल्ड्रंस लेक्चर बलदेव सिंह लिटरेली जर्नल बिगेन इन 
1977 ਵਿੱਚ ਦਾ ਪਬਲਿਕੇਸ਼ਨ ਆਫ ਗਿੱਲੀਆਂ ਛਿੱਟੀਆਂ ਦੀ ਅੱਗ ਏ ਕਲੈਕਸ਼ਨ ਆਫ ਸ਼ਾਰਟ ਸਟੋਰੀ ਆਫਟਰ ਵਰਕਿੰਗ ਐਜ਼ ਅ ਟੀਚਰ ਹੀ ਮੂਵਡ ਟੂ ਕੋਲਕਾਤਾ ਵੈਸਟ ਬੰਗਲ ਇਨ ਸਰਚ ਆਫ ਏ ਬੈਟਰ ਲਾਈਫ देयर ਹੀ ਵਰਕ ਐਜ਼ ਅ ਟਰੱਕ ਕਲੀਨਡ ਐਂਡ ਏ ਡਰਾਈਵਰ ਅੰਟਿਲ ਬਿਕਮਿੰਗ ਏ ਟਰੱਕ ਆਪਰੇਟਰ ਹੀ ਇਸ ਟਰੱਕ ਡਰਾਈਵਿੰਗ ਐਕਸਪੀਰੀਅੰਸ ਬਿਕਮ ਇਨ ਇਨ ਇਨਸਪੀਰੀਅੰਸ ਆਫ ਸੜਕਨਾਮਾ ਦਾ ਨੇਮ ਆਫ ਹਿਸ ਕਾਲਮ ਇਨ ਅਮਿਰਜਾ ਪ੍ਰੀਤਮਸ ਨਾਗਮਨੀ ਲੈਟਰ ਦਾ ਕਾਲਮ ਵੇਰ ਪਬਲਿਸ਼ਡ ਐਜ਼ ਦਾ 3 ਵੋਲਿਮ ਨੋਵਲ ਏਰਿੰਗ ਹਿਮ ਫੇਮ ਵਿਦ ਸੜਕਨਾਮਾ ਬਿਕਮਿੰਗ ਏ ਪਾਰਟ ਆਫ ਹਿਸ ਨੇਮ ਮਾਈ ਐਕਸਪੀਰੀਅੰਸ ਆਫ ਲਾਈਫ ਕਮਿੰਗ ਫਰਮ ਏ ਵੈਰੀ ਹੰਬਲ ਬੈਕਗ੍ਰਾਉਂਡ studying in government schools traveling three fourths of the country as a truck driver meeting people public people from varied walks of life have resulted in writing which are about people their life or society what we face am connected of the roots and the first platform was the column which run for 18 years and people connected my name with sadkanama and understanding their experience ads and author whose books lal batti deals with life in the red light area of kolkata these days the author is researching of uh, searching the life of shahid udham singh as history is a subject the remains close to his heart Suraj the Akh is a work of historical fiction uh, exploring the untold saga of the famous hero of Punjab Maharaja Ranjit Singh a historical novel says Sadkanama is different from the history of the readers come closer to who a character feels things and responds unlike history which is based on facts and figures when a writer uh writes about war he or she goes be, uh, beyond of uh battlefield and shoulders looking closely at the uh, trials and tribulations of the family who has lost a loved one society at large the impact of war and this is the entries premise premise of suraj the akh and i am so happy that my work has was appreciated and also award says the author who novels include andata panjwa sahab jada satluj mehda rahe the uh, Uh, satya academy award the best book in punjab in 2011 from the novel delhi de uh, delhi diyan uh, taama delhi de kingre on the uh, langri punjab rebel dulla patti baldev has also been on, honored with several award including the shiromni sahitkar award from the punjab government literature is a mirror of society and as writers we have to tell the truth fearlessly which i have done in all my work reflects mega based punjabi author baldev singh better known as baldev singh sadkanama whose novel suraj the akh sons i has won this year's uh, taha prize uh, from punjabi literature the taha prize instituted by the vancouver based organization called canada india education society celebrates celebrates according to its website the rich culture and transnational uh, heritage of the punjabi literature and language the prize aims to promote the growth of punjabi language globally to encourage new ima- emerging of established uh, writers working into the two punjabi scripts gurmukhi and uh, shahmukhi thank you so much thank you ma'am it was nice paper uh, i just wanted to ask is this a punjabi work or is this a translated work 
हेलो हेलो मैम कुलविंदर हेलो मैम इज दिस अ ट्रांसलेटेड वर्क और यू हैव वर्कड ऑन पंजाबी वर्क्स जी वर्कड ऑन पंजाबी वर्क अच्छा एवरीथिंग यू मेंशनड ऑल आर रिटन इन पंजाबी जी यस मैम ओके ओके इट वाज नाइस पेपर थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू सो मच मैम uh next uh, can we call upon to nimal joseph good afternoon ma'am good afternoon i have a ppt i will miss okay okay sure good afternoon everyone and the topic of my today's presentation is the fictionalization of india in select western travel writings a post colonial study it is a tough task to designate travel writing as fiction or non fiction the protean nature of the genre makes it extremely difficult to categorize even the most prevalent form of travel writing with its first person narrative cannot guarantee the claims of non fictionality This negotiation between the real and the fictional arises from the necessity of the travel writer to balance his role both as a reporter and as a storyteller. In his role as a reporter, he needs to present realistically what he has witnessed on his travels, and as a storyteller, he needs to make this presentation interesting for his readers. To achieve this dual role simultaneously, the writer has to incorporate his imagination into the facts of his travel log. In most cases. the second necessity overshadows the first so much so that the travel writer paints a picture of his destination that satisfies the preconceptions and prejudices of his intended readers occasionally this approach can transpose travel writing from a non fictional eyewitness account to one that filled with exotic fantasies and wondrous deeds this paper analyzes certain travel logs that fictionalized india with a special focus on travel logs by william darlimbe Carl Thompson has opined in his book Travel Writing that all examples of travel writing are by definition textual artifacts that have been constructed by the writers and publishers the need to design the travel narrative is a consequence of the inherent difficulty associated with transferring the travel experience into a text as the writer travels he collects a multitude of mental images and sensory experiences that can't be put into words at once by the time he sits that sits down to pen down his thoughts and feelings into a travel narrative he has to sift through an enormous amount of data most of which are trivial or insignificant insignificant to his purpose the process of selection that follows this will invariably imprint the author's preferences and his readers expectations this is where the fictional enters into the narrative the amount of fictionality in travel logs is of varying degrees Some travel writers strive to maintain a closeness to reality to accurately portray facts without compromising the aesthetic appeal of the narrative. Here any element of fictionality is incidental and the amount of omissions, additions and fabrications are minimal. On the other hand, there are travel writers who deliberately distort the experiences of their travel, often indulging in willful propagation of exotic and fantastical ideas about their destinations. There's a long history of travel logs which are intentionally designed to satiate the never-ending appetite of the bibliophiles longing for adventures and the chivalry from the narrator hero of the travel log. Hence it is of no wonder that modern travel writers are also keen to include fabricated facts that diminish the line between actual journeys and fictional voyages. As a travel traveler traverses a land and writes about it he pens down what he has seen and quite often the way he sees things will be determined by his cultural molding and pre-existing knowledge of the place so when he sees what he wants to see it will be a partial view of a place marked by willful omissions and manufactured facts likewise when a writer has to explain to his native readers something unfamiliar to them he has to resort to analogies that are known to them or has to fall back to the wondrous depiction or the exotic in both these affirmation strategies facts are distorted and travel logs resemble more to the epic phobias another inherent problem with travel writing genre is that like the translators travel writers are also writing for a specific group of readers jennifer speak points out the biased nature of travel logs when she opines 
I got sometimes travel writing conventions lead writers to favor an ethnographical or anthropological stance. At other times, travel writers are indistinguishable from novelists or writers of memoirs, but always the object of their gaze is a culture different from their own. Like a translator, the travel writer also facilitates his intended readers with a narrative space where they feel familiar. In his race to meet the expectations of his readers, he falters in his duty to the conventions of the genre. The fictionalization of India in Western travelogues. It seems that the Western travel writers consider their itinerary incomplete without traversing India. No other country might have exerted a similar fascination to travel writers all over the globe. Therefore, it is important to have an idea about the kind of image this travel, travel text propounds about India. Norman Lewis, in his travelogue, A Goddess in the Stones Travels in India, addresses India variously as a metaphorical jungle and a reservoir of endless color, pageantry, and interest. The very first paragraph of the travelogue has a vivid description of the rickshaw pullers of Bihar. He writes, Muffled against the cold and fog, the pullers look like Henry Moore's shrouded shelters in the wartime Tobe, or like Ethiopian refugees with only their stick thin legs showing be below their tattered body wrappings, or like Lazarus's call from the dead. These kind of bleak imaginings of India filled the pages of many Western travel writings. Travel writings of William Darlimble. An appropriate example is the travel writings of William Darlimble. His travelogues are modeled with great care and at several points overlap with history. He claims to show deep empathy with his subjects and often constructs his travelogues in a polyphonic manner, frequently letting his subjects speak for themselves with the least authorial interference. A travelogue like Nine Lives in Search of the Sacred in Modern India is a classic example of this method of travel writing. His highly reproving of postcolonial critics incessant targeting of travel writers and frequently discards any association with willful exoticization of a land and its people. In his preface to Visions of Mughal India, an anthology of European travel writing edited by Michael H. Fisher, William Darlimble explicitly shows, shows his displeasure at the postcolonial critics' treatment of travel writers. He says that, following the success of Edward Say's groundbreaking 1978 work Orientalism, the exploration of the East, its peoples, habits, customs, and past by European travelers has become the target for what has effectively become a major scholarly assault. Orientalist how, has been transformed from a simple descriptive label into a term of outright academic abuse. And men as diverse as the sophisticated French jeweler and aesthet Jean Baptiste Tavernier, Cornish Pilchard Merchant St. Peter Mundy, and the grand British judge and linguist Sir William Jones have all alike come to be seen as complicit in the project of gathering colonial knowledge and accused of being agents of colonialism attempting to appropriate Eastern learning and demonstrate the superiority of Western ways by imagining the East as decayed, degenerate, and picturesque, fit only to be colonized and civilized. He explains further that it is ridiculously simplistic to see all attempts at studying, observing, and empathizing with another culture necessarily as an act of domination rather than of understanding, respect, or even catharsis. If even, the attempt, if even the attempt to understand is seen as aggression or appropriation, then all human contact declines into paranoia. But this claim of Darlimble that postcolonial theorists are needlessly critiquing travel writers and adjudging them as orientalists is refuted by his own books. In his books, White Mughals, Love and Betrayal in 18th Century India, Darlimble writes the following. The Kirkpatricks inhabited a world that was far more hybrid and with far less clearly defined ethnic, ethnic, national, and religious borders than we have been conditioned to expect, either by the conventional imperial history books written in Britain before the 1947, or by the nationalist historiography of post-independence India, or for, for, or for that matter, by the post-colonial work coming from new generations of scholars, many of whom tend to follow the path followed, path opened up by Edward Said in 1978 with his pioneering Orientalism. In this passage, it is clearly discernible that Darlimble is using several of the drops of postcolonialism. The same critical perspective he disapproves as prejudicial towards travel writers, he himself employs to suit his purpose. Small Paul Smithers, in his essay, Post Orientalism and the Past Colonial in William Darlimble's Travel Histories, notes this contradiction in Darlimble's stance. He writes that themes of hybridization, transculturation, and boundary crossing figure strongly in Darlimble's work. 
and they are also typical of postcolonial theory. This suggests he is more attuned to theory than he might realize. Moreover, the above passage from White Mughals firmly establishes Darnable's designated readers. His use of the first person plural pronoun we indicates his cultural affiliation and the implied readers. It is evident that he is addressing Western readers through his works. The travelogue Nine Lives in Search of the Sacred in Modern India confirms many of the concerns raised above. The book received flag from Indian critics and intelligentsia. They were concerned about the outcome of the text. Darlemel himself was aware of those concerns. Uh, he writes that, uh, I quote, the intelligentsia in India presume that any foreigner writing about India is either going to be writing about sadhus, holy men, or magic or the Maharajas. And this book fit the first category. When I used to tell people I am writing a book about mysticism or spirituality, they would groan. On the one hand, you have to constantly prove you are innocent of colonial views, while on the other hand, coming from a different land, you tackle subjects from a different point of view. The apprehension of both the author and Indian critics proved to be true in nine lives. Darlemel has attempted, to, attempted a challenging and ambitious task in the travelogue. The stories of nine individuals belonging to divergent de devotions are selected from across the country. These people are vastly different from the other in every possible way, linguistically, culturally, socially, and economically. The encounters and interviews that provided material for the travelogue took place in eight different languages. Therefore, Darlimbul heavily relied upon interpreters and translators to mediate between him and his subjects. The linguistic impediment in translating deeply rooted cultural specific terms, rituals, and ideas has had a detrimental effect on the completed work. Even after spending decades in India, the world of India has not become the world of the author. This is echoed when he comments in Nine Lives that, a sort of world where a committed naked Naga Sadhu could also be an MBA was something I was to become used to in the course of my travels for this book. The level of understanding a writer can have of this other world is another matter of concern. Darlimil has gone great lengths to prove his innocence of colonial views. The author narrator is conspicuously less prominent in the travelogue. Darlimbal maintains that it is to subvert the prevalent traditions of travel writing. He states that travel writing tended to highlight the narrator. His adventures were the subject. The people he met were sometimes reduced to objects in the background. With the nine lives, I have tried to invert this and keep the narrator firmly in the shadows. So bringing the lives of the people I have met to the fore and placing their stories firmly center stage. This can be seen as a ploy from the part of the author to shield himself from any criticism or exoticization or lack of empathy. By, main, by maintaining that the people in the text speaks for themselves, the author is denying any role in the incidents narrated. But like any other author, it is evident that Darlimbal exercises his authorial authority in the selection and construction of the narrative and is guilty of omissions and commissions. He admits this while acknowledging that the materials for the travelogue is personal and entirely subjective selection. These are simply the stories of nine people from nine traditions that happen to interest or appeal to him. It is ironical when an author claims that in certain areas of the text he has retained his subjectivity, whereas in the rest of it he is an objective spectator to his subjects. This ob obvious irony needs to be examined. The travelogue is painstakingly crafted to alleviate any suspicion of apathy of which Western travel writers are accused of by the postcolonial critics. This statement narrating uh, the genesis of the travelogue paints an empathetic picture of the author as an interested observer who derides judgment. Darlimul observes that. As each of these characters live in the self-contained moral universes of their own religious and ethical systems, I have tried not to judge. And though my choices and arrangement no doubt reveal something of my views and preferences, I have tried to show rather than tell and to let the characters speak for themselves. The grand design of Darlimbul in these assertions emulates the authenticating or factualizing techniques adopted by modern travel writers for quite some time. The narrative and literary devices inherited by modern travel writers from a long lineage of their predecessors make them better equipped in fabricating the reality. In the case of Nine Lives, Darlimil has designed the travel narrative in the form of interviews. This makes the travelogue more personal and gives a greater sense of credibility. It is like the writer is just reproducing the notes he has recorded during his personal interactions with each of these nine characters. The narrative is carefully modeled to specify that not only the writer is physically present in the places described in the travelogue, but he has heard his subjects and is reporting the same words and emotions conveyed by them. This is a more powerful form of reporting transferred into a travelogue. Uh, conclusion, the process of othering in travelogues of the post-colonial era is far more subtle than the outright sense of superiority and domination showed by many of their foreigners. Explicit racism and cultural domination is not feasible in the modern scenario without inviting strong disapprobation. 
but this does not mean that modern travelogues are free of these tendencies altogether. In her work, The Global Politics of Contemporary Travel Writing, Debbie Diesel describes what the travel writers of the West are formulating as a cosmopolitan vision. Unlike their colonial predecessors, these writers frame encounters with others in positive ways. They reveal moments of empathy, recognition of difference, realization of equality, and insights into shared values. However, this cosmopolitanism is certainly not blameless. This neo-colonial cosmopolitan travelogue is equally or per perhaps more sinister than their colonial counterpart. It should be noted that travel writing still remains as a field dominated by Western writers, mostly white, who strive to entertain their Western assemblage of readers with accounts of their others. In order to do that, these travel writers have to ascertain the rights of representation, judgment, and mobility that are effects of empire. The, suggest the suggested imperialism in modern Western travelogues is evident in the liberty taken by these writers in passing judgments and comments upon people all over the world, as if it is in their right to do so. The claim of authority these writers exercise upon their subjectives reminiscent of the colonial past. Also of importance is the fact that many of these writers consider themselves as superior beings than the people about whom they are writing. This travel narrative asserts the comparatively privileged position of most travel writers and their readers. Another alarming attribute of these narratives is that, in a way, they underpin the perceived notions of superiority of the West over the rest in the minds of their readers and justifies that feeling of superiority that the Western reader would love to hold on. This sort of legitimization of power and moral authority is achieved by the careful formulation of a narrative that clearly differentiates the self of the author and the reader from the other in the text. Therefore, travel writing remains a genre thoroughly enmeshed in and contributive to the neocolonial networks of power and inequality by which the West maintains its current global dominance. These are the works cited by, by me for this paper. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I was just about to say okay, you should wind it up, but you've already wind it up. Thank you so much. And you have chosen a very different and very interesting topic. I was so involved in that that I didn't want you to stop. <laughs> it was actually so good. And why Thank have you me. chosen travelogues and not any novel or any fiction or? It is the area of my research, man. Travelogues are my areas, area of research for my PhD. Okay. That's really a good topic. Thank you so much. And you have also explained it very well. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mungeshwaran Hurem from Manipur. Are you there? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So yeah. we'll carry on with the. Okay. Uh, respected chairperson and fellow presenters, good afternoon to you all. The title of my presentation is The State Centric Security Approach to India's Neighborhood Policy and Its Impact on the Development of Northeast India. As we, we can all see, Northeast India is situated in the easternmost par part of India, and the geographical location of Northeast East India is in such a way that it is landlocked and virtually isolated from the rest of India, with only a tenuous connection through the Silicuri Corridor or chicken, uh, Chicken's Neck uh, in the state of West Bengal. As such, Northeast India is located closer to some of India's eastern neighbors than to mainland India. This has led to the peripheral nature and isolation of the region. The geographical isolation of Northeast region from the rest of India, along with the topography and climatic conditions of the region have hindered the development efforts in the region. More, moreover, the lack of integration with the rest of India, along with the presence of ethnic political movements in the region has led to issues of, issues of political instability and violence in the region. Thus, Northeast India faces peculiar issues and challenges which have furthered the underdevelopment of the region. Uh, so, Northeast India continues to be, in a, to be in a state of territorial and developmental trap. The state of Northeast India's territorial trap had its roots in the British colonial rule. The British conquest of the region and its differential administration of hill, tribal hill regions in the Northeast laid the roots for its peripheral nature and isolation of the region from the rest of India and its treatment as a frontier territory. Subsequently, the partition of India in 1947 severed uh, Northeast India's connection with the country's heartland through the East, well, uh, East Bengal, which is the present state of Bangladesh, uh, country of Bangladesh. Before the partition, 
Northeast India was connected with mainland India through the present day Bangladesh via a multimodal transportation network. Following the partition, these traditional channels of transport and communication got disrupted. So, Northeast India was just left virtually isolated and landlocked from the rest of India, <coughs> except through the connection, uh, except the narrow connection through the Silk Road corridor. And apart from this, the emergence of a number of insurgent movements in Northeast India after India's independence compelled the Indian Indian government to close off and tighten the border areas in the Northeast region to secure and defend the national boundary and also to prevent against foreign aids and intervention in such internal disruptions. The consequences of which is that Northeast India is viewed as a strategically sensitive region that needs to be protected to safeguard India's national security uh, vis -a vis its neighbors. And as uh, security considerations overshadow all other aspects of India's relation with its neighbors, the interests and concerns of Northeast India have taken a back seat. The securitization or militarization of Northeast India, uh, India, along with the violence perpetrated by the various insur group, uh, insurgent groups of the region, as well as the frequent burns, protests, and economic blockades, uh, has hindered the development process in the region. The risks associated with uh, insurgency-related violence, militarization, and political instability in the region has deterred investments and curtailed the business environment in the region. Overall, it has affected the economic, social, and political well-being of the region and had contributed to the further isolation and underdevelopment of the region. <clears throat> also, the peculiar geographic, political, and economic situation of the Nordic region has made the development of the region also dependent on India's constructive engagement with its traditional neighborhood. However, because of India's approach to the Nordic region as a strategic and security sensitive region, and the legacy of treating the region as a frontier, frontier territory, security concerns had primarily dictated India's policy towards its neighbors for a very long time. The existence of various security restrictions along with the tightening of controls along the borders has inhibited Northeast India's effective engagement with the bordering countries. However, as <clears throat> However, a new pers uh, perspective gradually developed among the intellectuals and policymakers that emphasize on opening up and connecting the Nordic region with its traditional uh, neighborhood. In that regard, the integration of Nordic region within the Look East policy, with its emphasis on enhancing connectivity and economic integration of the region with Southeast Asia, provided a new framework for breaking the isolation and underdevelopment of the region. And with the recent transition from Look East to Aegis policy in 2014, the, the role of Nordic India and the consideration of its developmental needs have been given added emphasis in the policy. However, still, an important factor inhibiting the full and meaningful participation of Nordic India in the Aegis policy is the continuing securitization of India's national borders, international borders in Nordic India. The securitization and tightening of border controls has stifled cross border cooperation. Um, <clears throat> as we can see from the example of the this thing, Stilwell Road, which existed in the this thing, colonial period. Uh, the Stilwell Road, which connects the state of Assam and Arunachal Pradesh in India with China's Yunnan province and northwestern provinces of Myanmar, has lots of prospects for connectivity and economic integration of Northeast India with the East and Southeast Asia. However, India is still reluctant to open it up and take advantage of it because of the security concerns. Thus, Northeast region of India continues to be in a state of territorial and developmental trap. Uh, in order to escape from such situations, there, in, there is a need for ushering in development in the region through the desecuritization and opening of the region and ensuring empowerment and involvement of the people in the political and developmental process. Uh, a move towards such uh, objectives should start with the replacement of the state-centric security approach with the people-centric uh, development approach in the region. Uh, sustained growth and development are possible only when the people are made active participants in the economic and political decision-making process. And given the important uh, role that transnational cooperation plays in the development of the region, uh, there is a need for better integration of the needs and 
concerns of the region in India's neighborhood policy. Uh, this concludes the end of my short presentation. Thank you for all for listening. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. You have presented the situation of Northeast people and the security issues very clearly and very comfortably. It Thank was you, really nice. And I think people who are not at all related to the Northeast zone, they mm -hmm. they can't understand that much as you people understand. Can yeah, yeah. belong to the area and I have also come to know a lot many new things which I never knew. Thank you so much. Okay, thank, thank you so you, much.